last week, or last week, two weeks ago when I was here last, time flies, it's amazing. Um, last I was with you, we, we looked at uh, Psalm 42, and if, if you remember uh, that from two weeks ago, um, we asked the following question. You know, to, to whom do you turn to in times of trouble? Is it to God or to someone or something else? And throughout that song, we, we saw how David responded. You know, there, there was a back and forth of, of David feeling that sense of despair and yet at the same time also coming to different points of, of rejoicing and remembering who God is through those times of, of time of trial and trouble. And what it comes down to really is, is a matter of faith. David had faith so that even in those tough times, he could remember back who God is and what God had done for him throughout his life and providing David comfort in those, those times of need. For, for those of us who may have been raised in the church or for those who have been believers for a while, who may also have an understanding of, of scripture, regardless of all of that, if you read David's words, we can find some comfort, some sense of solace uh, from that in our own times of trouble. But as we look out in the world and even see the, the news this morning of, of continuing violence that happens, those senseless acts, it doesn't seem to appear to do much for the rest of the world, though, does it? And we look out throughout the landscape of this country and Increasingly, we see that, that churches are dwindling in size, churches are closing their doors, and it may especially be true in larger cities in this country, but it's, it's happening all throughout the world, not just in this country. And if we were to talk to anyone on the street that we run into, just a, a random person, you know, if we try and bring up spiritual matters, it's, it's likely that you'll get varying responses, but will sound something probably like this. You know, they'll, they'll look at you and, and maybe look at you like you're crazy. You know, some people will try and avoid you. Some will just say outright, leave me alone. You know, I don't have time for this. I don't want to hear about your God. And it's becoming much less and less that perhaps somebody there's you come across that will say, tell me more. I'd like to hear more about Jesus. And a lot of American Christians are, are bemoaning the, the state of affairs in this country. You know, you watch any evangelist or any uh, church person in the news and you know, it seems like there's this constant state of, of complaining. And, you know, I, it is distressing to watch what's happening in this country. But by complaining, it almost appears that people seem to think that our salvation comes by those who are elected into office or, you know, by politics, that somehow politics is going to save us and save the day. <laughs> And as we look and, and see this, you know, this complaining, if, if we look in the Old Testament, they're, they're really no different than the Old Testament uh, is, Israelites, right? I mean, time after time, we, we see these Israelites wandering in the desert, and it's understandable why they're complaining. You know, I don't think I'd want to spend 40 years walking in the, the desert wilderness that they had to go through. But at the same time, they should have known better, really, that, that God was there with them, walking with them through their time of trouble. He led them by, by pillar of fire at night and by cloud, of, of, uh, by cloud during the day. 
And you see, by their example, that complaining really does nothing for our faith. And in fact, it, it really kind of reveals a lack of faith in God, doesn't it? So, with the things that we see on the news and the things that people are saying, what, what are we to do then? And the, the easiest Sunday school answer of it that I can give is to have faith. But that's easier said than done, though, right? Then we come across a verse like we find in, in our reading, uh, it's actually a little bit before our reading, in verses 6 and 7 of 1 Peter 1. Uh, verses 6 and 7 say this, So be truly glad. There is wonderful joy ahead, even though you must endure many trials for a little while. These trials will show that your faith is genuine. It is being tested as fire tests and purifies gold though your faith is far more precious than mere gold. So when your faith res remains strong through many trials, it will bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the whole world. We want to be glad, right? We want to be happy. We want to live in that state of perpetual bliss, of, of happiness and joy and and to go through those experiences without having any kind of troubles. And then we come to that latter part of these verses, and we not only hear that we'll go through trials, but that we can expect those things. And it's not just a trial singular, it's many trials. And what does that do to us when we hear these things? It, we don't, we don't like to hear that. But how we respond to these trials reveals what we truly believe about God. How big or how small do you believe God is? Do you think he will walk with you through these times? Are we simply trying to live out a joyful existence for our own comfort? Or are we looking towards the reward mentioned in verse 9? The reward being the salvation of our souls. And of all the disciples, Peter knows probably better than any of them that, you know, he, he's a prime example of what he's talking about here. But it's all of what's happened in hindsight of everything that Peter went through with Jesus. If you recall from two weeks ago, we, we saw how Peter was one of the disciples that witnessed Jesus' transformation into glory on the Mount of Transfiguration. Peter himself saw Jesus reveal himself in glory. If you happen to see that in person, don't you think that would have just a little bit of an effect on your faith? To see Christ in glory before you, before your very eyes? I think it would have just a small effect on, on anybody, regardless of who they are. And as a witness, you know, Peter was someone who walked and talked with Jesus. Peter is telling us for certain, without a shadow of a doubt, that there is something better and something more extraordinary that is to come after this life. Doesn't that make you wonder what heaven is going to be like? But until that happens, you know, we're, we're left to our own imagination. And Sometimes our own thoughts get away from us and we, we dwell in those times of, of trial and, and struggle. We forget and lose sight of that glory that's, that is yet to come. Now Peter also experienced and saw what we can expect before we reach glory ourselves. We should expect trial and trouble and persecution. 
But while he shows us that we will go through these things, he reveals that there is also a purpose in going through these trials. And that is to show us whether or not our faith is genuine. It should cause us to ask that same question from two weeks ago. To whom do you turn in times of trouble? Is it to God? Or is it to someone or something else? But having faith in Christ means that action is required of us. In verses 13 and following, you know, there's several things that we are called to do if we express faith in Christ. Listen to some of these. Prepare your minds for action. How do we do that? Well, it's by praying, by going before the Lord and requesting time with him to communicate with him to know what his heart has for each of us, to seek his face and to try and live that out as best we can. We prepare our minds for action by reading and learning and, and knowing scripture. And through that, we begin to learn how to answer people's questions about how God works, how we understand and know that these things will happen and that we can have faith in God and he will deliver us through those times. Another action that is required is that we must exercise self-control. Not an easy thing to do, is it? Whether it's eating, just to pull a, a random example out of that, you know, I like to eat as much as the next person, and like yesterday, you know, it was nice, we had a picnic outdoors, and it was really hard to stop eating. But yet we're called to exercise self-control because that in turn glorifies God. Put your hope in God's grace and salvation to be revealed at Christ's return. Also, we must live as God's obedient children. Peter tells us, you know, don't backslide into old behaviors to satisfy your own selfish desires. Additionally, go be holy in everything, which is another way of saying, strive to be like Jesus. Now, if you're sitting there wondering, well, you know, we're told to do these things. You know, isn't, isn't that trying to, to earn our way to salvation? Well, note that these things aren't required for us to earn our salvation, but are instead required because of our salvation. It is because of our salvation that we desire to grow in faith. It is out of recognition of God's immense love for us and for all of mankind that we seek to put him above everything else that we think, everything else we say and do. And Peter also tells us in, in verse 17 that we need to live in reverent fear because while God does indeed love us and others, he is also a very righteous and holy judge. Now that right there is a, a statement that, that many people hear and they say, well, I don't want to have anything to do or you know, I don't want to live in fear of an angry God. Have you heard things like that being said? And in one sense, they're right. You know, who would want to live that way? But people who think this way need to understand a couple of things. First, is that regardless of whether or not they accept God as God, all of us will be subject to his judgment. And secondly, they also need to understand that there are different kinds of fear. So back to the first point, whether or not they accept God as God, 
that we will be subject to his judgment. A handy resource that I have is the, the New Bible Dictionary, and it, it calls this sort of fear slavish fear. This is a fear that is a natural consequence of sin. And it's felt by those who reject Christ, which results in that sort of nagging and ongoing fearful expectation of God's judgment. In Proverbs uh, 28.1, it says that the wicked run away when no one is chasing them. And it's, it's that kind of thing that can result in, in various phobias or superstitions or you know, maybe it's even having an irrational fear of people or the things that people do. People caught up in sin know that what they're doing is wrong. Even as Christians, when we do something wrong, we know in the back of our minds that it's not okay. And oftentimes people say, well, my conscience is bothering me. Well, no, it's, it's not your conscience, but the Holy Spirit who is trying to help all of us understand the consequences of our behaviors. Romans 2.15 talks about this when it mentions that people's actions reveal what is really written on their hearts. And isn't it fascinating to watch what happens when people come to Christ? Those fears tend to go away. No longer is there an irrational fear of, of people or things. You know, it, the other half of that verse in Proverbs says, but the godly are bold as lions. There is a transition to what the New Bible Dictionary calls holy fear. Now this other kind of fear is, is something that is God-given that enables people to, to revere and respect God's authority over creation. It gives a desire to obey his commandments and, and to begin to hate and shun all forms of evil. Psalm 111 verse 10 calls this holy fear the foundation of wisdom. Proverbs 8.13 uh, shows how, how, it's how someone lives an upright and righteous life. Psalm 147.11 says it's something in which God delights. So rightly understood, having this, this holy fear is a desire to love and honor God. It is that desire that flows out of an understanding of who God is, beginning to grasp the, the power and might that is in God's hands. And we'll never escape the fact that the day of judgment is coming, but this love and respect for God causes people to seek out holiness, to try and please God by living righteous lives and to love others as God loves them. This is explained further by Peter in, in verses 2 through 5. If you'd like to read along with me, um, it starts in verse 2. God the Father knew you and chose you long ago, and his Spirit has made you holy. As a result, you have obeyed him and have cleansed, or have been cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. May God give you more and more grace and peace. All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is by his great mercy that we have been born again, because God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Now we live with great expectation, and we have a priceless inheritance an inheritance that is kept in heaven for you, pure and undefiled, beyond the reach of change and decay. And through your faith, God is protecting you by his power until you receive 
this salvation, which is ready to be revealed on the last day for all to see. There is joy in this holy and reverent fear of God. Faith in Christ results in the priceless inheritance that is offered through salvation, which we will fully realize at Christ's return. And we should also note something in verse 5 here. God protects the elect. And, and by, how do I know that it's to the elect? Well, if you look back at verse 1, we see who this letter is to that Peter is writing. He is writing to God's chosen people. It's God protecting his people, the elect, by his power until we receive this salvation of Christ. And also note that, that after coming to faith, life suddenly just doesn't become easy peasy. You know, it's, it's not some magic bullet that's, that's going to make all of life's problems go away. There will be trials. And why? Peter tells us it's to reveal the genuineness of our faith. For you see, genuine faith is enduring faith. It is that faith that Job displayed amidst all of the, the calamities that he and his family suffered. It is this faith that the apostle showed when he they had to endure beatings, imprisonment, and being mocked by those around them. Now, I'm not saying that, that as believers we will suffer under physical violence and potentially martyrdom, but whether or not that happens, we should not be surprised if it does happen. It certainly happens in other nations in the world that we see. And that sounds like fun, huh? But notice what happens, though, as, as believers when we go through these trials. To whom do we turn in times of trouble? To God. Who carries us through those times, oftentimes in surprising ways? God does. Think about what we saw two weeks ago from Psalm 42 in the life of David. We see how those, those ups and downs in David's life played out in his own life. And we often experience those same highs and lows. So when you come out on the other end of a trial and, and experience that sense of relief, what do we hear most everyone say, whether or not they're believers or unbelievers? Usually hear something like, thank God. Yes, thank God. Thank him and praise him for all that he does. Thank him for the trial that caused you to see his strength carry you through that storm. Remember that, that opening psalm that we read earlier. Give thanks to the Lord and proclaim his greatness. Let the whole world know what he has done. Sing to him, yes, sing him praises. Tell everyone about his wonderful deeds. Exalt in his holy name. Rejoice, you who worship the Lord. Search the Lord and for his strength continually seek him. Remember the wonders he has performed, his miracles and the rulings he has given. Tying that in with 1 Peter uh, 1.17, this is how we live life in the reverent fear and awe of God. We praise him and we thank him for carrying us through and, and giving us the offer of salvation. You see, when it all comes down to it, that that bottom line is that it's all about faith. It's all about love. 
True faith is a living and acting thing that produces love. If we do indeed have that genuine faith, we praise God in the midst of any trial that we go through because we know that God loves us. He is faithful and he himself will carry us through those times. It is this love of Christ that gives us the desire to rid ourselves of the behaviors mentioned in uh, verse 2, sorry, chapter 2, verse 1. Those things like deceit and hypocrisy and jealousy and all unkind speech. Faith in Christ and the love of great love and grace of Christ is this cure. For in that is forgiveness. And what stifles that from coming through? Very often it's it's our own pride. It's the pride of men and women that, that keep us at bay. We all have that desire to be loved. But pride tells us that we can be loved on our own terms. Adam and Eve themselves gave in to this deception of Satan in the Garden of Eden. That they could be their own self-reliant gods. But we see what happens is that it only leaves one wanting for the true love of God. Do we believe in a God who loves us so much that he sent his only son, Jesus, to die in our stead, taking on the full punishment of sin that we ourselves deserve? If so, this faith demands that we love God. It demands that we love others because of our love of God. It demands that we put the needs of others above our own wants and desires. That's still really hard to do, isn't it? And why? It's because we still suffer from the effects of sin. We will until Christ returns. Unfortunately, believing in Christ is only part of the journey. We know that there are going to be trials and struggle because of the fact, the simple fact, that there is sin in this world. And because of that, we must have active faith that's talked about here in First Peter. So desire to grow in faith. Pray for greater faith. Strive to love others better than you do today. Ask God to show you how to be more like his son Jesus and how to exercise that self-control. Prepare your minds for action by reading the Bible. And look beyond the trials and troubles of this world to know that God is carrying us through till we come to that day of future glory. All of that translates into love. And as we love others more, as we love them better, they begin to see the love of God and the hope that we have through Jesus Christ. An act of faith in Christ speaks louder than our words ever will and ever could. Let us pray. Our God and, and our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the hope and faith that we can have through your Son, Jesus. We thank you for the grace you constantly pour out to us and even thank you for the trials of this life. Thank you for the testing of our faith. It is our prayer that you continue to guide us through these times and trials, that we may be found faithful. And as we grow in our faith, we hope and pray that you would help us love you more 
which in turn helps us to love others better. We pray that you would protect us from prideful love that, that seeks to put attention on ourselves. May we give you all the glory. As this happens, Father, may others see this love that you have for us and that we have for you so that your Holy Spirit may work in them and give them that same desire to turn to you and may be granted that same saving faith. Thank you that you are with, with us here today, and that you are with us wherever we go. Grant us your peace and your mercy, we pray, in the name of your Son, Jesus.